Hi, welcome everyone. Welcome. Hello, good to morning. see you. Wonderful to have you all here. We might just wait um, a couple of minutes to get going. Um, there's a few still joining. Um, whilst we're waiting, just a couple of um, quick housekeeping issues. Um, if you need French interpretation, French is available today. So please select French as your preferred language in the interpretation menu below. Allez. Bonjour, chers collègues. Merci bien pour votre participation aujourd'hui. Nous avons des opportunités pour l'interprétation en français pour ces dialogues. Si vous avez la possibilité de cliquer dans l'option dans d'interprétation ici, c'est l'option du français là. Et si vous avez des questions, vous pouvez nous écrire dans le, dans le chat. Merci beaucoup et nous sommes très contents d'avoir votre participation aujourd'hui. Great. Thanks so much, Alejo. And just a reminder, in case anyone would prefer to attend this dialogue in Spanish or Portuguese, we will also be offering those dialogues in Spanish and Portuguese later this week on Thursday and then on Friday. So please reach out to the team if you prefer uh, to attend. It'll be the same content, um, but the dialogue will be in Spanish or Portuguese. Great, I think we can get going. Um, so thank you everybody for joining this dialogue. It's our voices at the center of food systems transformation, an open dialogue on the Rio conventions and a non-state actor call to action. My name is Melissa Pinfield and I'm the executive director of the Just Rural Transition Initiative. So the Just Rural Transition, JRT, is housed at Meridian Institute and we bring together farmers, indigenous peoples, governments, businesses, investors, civil society, local communities, many other actors to champion equitable solutions to food systems challenges, centered on the needs and priorities of those who work at the front lines of climate change. So as I mentioned before, but for those who are new to joining, if you would like to listen to today's presentation in French, in interpretation in French, please select that as your preferred language in the interpretation menu below. As you come into the meeting, we invite you to use the chat function to introduce yourselves. We won't go round and, and do introductions, um, but please do just use the chat function as, as much as you want today to introduce yourself, ask any questions, share perspectives with the rest of your, with the participants. Um, it's great to see many friendly faces here uh, that we've we've met um, in the past on many of these dialogues and conversations and also to see some new people join this space. So welcome to you. This open dialogue is primarily to provide space for frontline food system actors and the organizations that represent them. We're really glad also attending this. We've had some interest in other actors uh, from different backgrounds and perspectives. So we encourage all participants to listen attentively and learn from one another today. Since its inception in 2020, Just Rule Transition has been committed to engage with diverse actors to mobilize change for the transformation of food systems. We do this through a number of, of, of means. We support global policy dialogues for sustainable agriculture, which is co-hosted by the United Kingdom and the World Bank. This is working with national governments to strengthen Royaume-Uni pour uh, renforcer la collaboration, d'apprendre les uns des autres pour uh, modifier la politique autour de l'agriculture et l'utilisation cadastrale. Nous avons Space, disseminate knowledge and coordinate advocacy for agriculture and food policy reform. If you're interested in learning about any of those, please do reach out to the team. But most importantly, and as reflected in the session today, we are really proud to serve as the liaison for frontline food system actors around the world to elevate your voices via communications efforts, building partnerships and supporting attendance at global events and processes. For the past two years, we've organized delegations to actively participate at the UNFCCC COP27 and COP28 with generous support from philanthropic organizations. 
And I have to say, for me, it's been one of the most positive experiences is to hear the feedback from frontline food system actors directly in how attendance at those sorts of meetings have really benefited them. 2024 is another opportunity to elevate your priorities and your key asks to influence global narratives through the three Rio conventions. We have the Nature Convention, the CBD, coming up in Colombia at the end of October. We have the Climate Convention, the UNFCCC in Azerbaijan this November, and the Land Convention, UNCCD, in Saudi Arabia in December. We at the Just Rule Transition are really excited and proud to be collaborating with the Climate Champions team and Ambition Loop to drive momentum and alignment on the non-state actor food systems call to action that we launched together at COP28 and mobilize collective efforts around this shared vision of food systems that places frontline food system actors right at its center and looks at how we can adapt and build resilience and support them to, as they face climate and other risks. So this dialogue is a safe space to listen, learn, and we really want to share, hear from you about your key priorities and how we can use them to shape how we prepare for the three Rio conventions. Identify areas of collaboration and collective influencing and learn more about advocacy plans around the Food Systems Call to Action. Now, I know I've spoken a lot already. We really want to make sure that we have a lot of space for the dialogue section where we can hear uh, from you. Before we do that, I've just got a couple of speakers who are going to help set the scene. We have Gonzalo Munoz, the high-level champion for COP25 and chair of the non-state actor pillar of COP28, Presidencies, Food Systems and Agricultural Agenda. He's going to share a few more details about the work to take forward the, call, the Food Systems Call to Action. Then my colleague Holly Foster is going to provide an overview of some of the communications opportunities. And we really want to get your feedback on what would be most useful to you, frontline food system actors, as we prepare for the Rio conventions. We're going to then hear from Belen Titoler and Richard Kachunga. Both of them are dear friends of the Just Rule Transition, and we're so grateful that they can join today and hear about their, some of their thoughts around high-level events and collaboration opportunities. Then, last but not least, I'm going to turn to Alejo Magini, who's going to facilitate an open dialogue where we want to hear from all of you. So if you have any questions, please use the chat function. Thank you so much for joining us today. Without much more speaking from me, I'm going to hand over to Gonzalo Munoz. Thank you very much, Melissa, um, and great to be with all of you today. Uh, I am Gonzalo Munoz. I'm first and foremost a farmer from Chile. Uh, so food and farming is absolutely close to my heart. Uh, and as, of course, uh, Melissa already mentioned, I was previously a high-level champion for COP25. And I continue to work very closely with the high-level champions for COP28 and COP29, Her Excellency Rasan al-Mubarak and Her Excellency Nigar al padaray And I am also a co-founder of a new Global South NGO called Ambition Loop. It's based in Chile, which I'm very excited uh, to have set up at the start of this year with a group of amazing people, some of them in this call. Uh, so first, I want to start by, by thanking you for your attendance today and for your continued support and commitment. The, the transformation that we all aim to achieve in food systems can only, only be realized through listening and through learning from all of you, the farmers, the producers, and the communities who are at the heart of these systems. Your knowledge, your experiences, and the proactive engagement are absolutely essential for driving meaningful change, and you are the true leaders of this movement. I want to thank, of course, all those organizations who represent frontline food systems actors who worked with all of us uh, during last year to develop uh, and, and launch the food system call to action at COP28, and for those of you who joined this collective effort this year. From the, very, from, from the very start of this process, it was hugely important, the call to action centered on the needs and perspective of frontline food system actors, which includes, of course, more holders and family farmers, indigenous people, women, youth, and of course, local communities and their organizations. The call to action sets out 10 priority actions and four principles, offering a shared vision for food system transformation. It outlines the vital role and contributions of farmers, 
and frontline food system actors and what they need to thrive and prosper and the vital role of governments in creating the enabling conditions to accelerate action. The call to action is not just about articulating what needs to change. We know that we need to transform our global food systems to deliver for people, nature, and climate. It's now about demonstrating how we take action. And frontline food system actors, farmers, indigenous people, and local communities are essential to making this happen. I think we're all absolutely proud of what we achieved during last year, positioning uh, the topic, the people in the center of the climate agenda. Now we need to demonstrate that we are fully committed. So I'm delighted that we are continuing to grow the endorser network with new endorsers joining this group of food system leaders every day. This is really important if we are to continue to build momentum and be vocal and visible in global policy and investment discussions and advocate for governments and other actors to put in place enabling and supporting conditions to scale action and support farmers and frontline food system actors. So again, we did an incredible effort and we achieved an incredible goal by positioning all of this in the center of the agenda. We now have more than 280 endorsers representing vast networks of farmers, indigenous people, women, youth, and local communities, as well as civil society, business cities, research institutes, philanthropies, and others. It's amazing. And that doesn't happen spontaneously. That happened because of an incredible work of amazing people and organizations putting these, uh, these topics and these people in the center of the agenda. So I would encourage all of you who haven't yet endorsed the call to action to consider endorsing it right now. No one can be left out of this conversation and no one can subtract themselves for being in the center of the agenda in this right moment. Because COP29 and COP30 are critical milestones to keep momentum alive on food systems, as well as CBD, COP16, and the CCD, the United Nations Convention to Compact Desertification, COP16, as Melissa mentioned earlier. I particularly want to highlight UNCCD, the, 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 the Desertification Convention, as a new opportunity to influence ambitious outcomes on food systems, including the land, water, and healthy soils. Under the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia COP16 presidency, Ambition Loop will be supporting the development of an ambitious action agenda, which will promote the synergies with the food systems call to action. So we would also love to partner with all of you on that specific agenda to help us connect the dots and again, push for all of these people and community center agenda to be, as I said, in the center of what's being discussed in each of these conventions. As you can see on this slide, we have set a key priorities firmly embedded in the call to action that centers on frontline food system actors as the critical agents of change. You, the smallholder farmers, the family farmers, indigenous peoples, and local communities are the key actors in shaping and advancing the call to action. Farmers and indigenous people must be recognized as critical agents of change and solutions. We must respect and value the traditional knowledge of indigenous people and the local knowledge of farmers, fishers, ranchers, and pastoralists, particularly highlighting the role of women, women and youth. So since the launch of the call to action at COP28, with our partners at the Just Rural Transition, we have had many opportunities to engage with many of you to hear about your advocacy priorities. We are developing five key asks ahead of the upcoming three Rio conventions, which we are keen to, to test with you, building on the food system call to action. These are, one, support farmers and indigenous peoples, these, these groups, definitely need to be actively recognized as key to the transition and solution providers supported with direct access to funding and meaningful included, uh, meaningfully included in the policy and decision-making processes. Second, we need to take action to transition to and scale up sustainable regenerative agroecological approaches, improve food environments to increase availability, accessibility, and affordability of healthy, nutritious, sustainable, and locally appropriate diets. Protect, conserve, and restore nature, and also, of course, reduce food loss and waste. 
Third, we need to scale and reorient all sources of finance to incentivize and fund resilient, sustainable, and equitable food system, also including the transition plans. For update and implement action plans. Government need to update and implement NDCs and NEPSAPs. Uh, businesses and financial institutions also need to set up and deliver on science-based targets and update and implement strategies and plans to deliver on global and national targets. And fifth, we need to strengthen global targets to align food systems with SDGs, Paris Agreement, and global diversity frameworks. And of course, with the as I said, the desertification convention with timescales setting out clearly what needs to be achieved and uh, by when. So today we would like to update uh, all of you on our plans. Uh, we want to test what we have heard from you and ensure we are on the right track to elevate your key priorities through our communication efforts, including at the three Rio conventions later this year. Your inputs, uh, your, your input is, is very important as we continue to refine this agenda and advocate for actions that support frontline food system actors as critical actors in mobilizing collective efforts around a shared vision of food systems that deliver significant measurable progress for people, nature, and climate. So again, I encourage if any one of you hasn't signed the call to action, please do so, because that it's extremely meaningful for strengthening the position of all of these communities in the center of this agenda. Holly now is going to provide a bit more clear detail uh, about our communication plans. And after that, I look forward to hearing from all of you and happy to answer any questions you may have. So over to you, Holly. Thank you, Gonzalo. And thank you everyone for joining today. I'm very pleased to be jumping in ahead of our open dialogue to share more about our advocacy and communication support under the non-state actor call to action. Um, so as Gonzalo highlighted, uh, the voices and asks of frontline community actors are at the heart of what we're doing and the heart of the non-state actor call to action. Um, and we would very much like to provide a platform that can best amplify your voices and spotlight the work of the individuals and organizations who have endorsed the call to action um, and doing your best for our, our global food systems. Um, so I'll briefly take down the slides um, so that I can talk further about um, our work moving forwards and the communications campaign that will be um, spotlighting this month for the entities and actors who have endorsed the call to action. Um, the campaign will include highlighting your work on our social media channels, in our newsletters and on our on online publications, as well as additional media opportunities. Um, and within our, uh, within our endorsement form, we've now integrated additional fields where you can share more information about your entity and your work. Um, however, we have now developed a separate form for those of you who have already submitted your statements of action. Um, so I believe in chat, you should see popping up two forms uh, titled the endorsement form for any new endorsers who have joined us today and a communications form for our current endorsers. Um, and the endorsement form is available in all UN languages and in Portuguese. Um, and in chat, you'll see links to our English and French forms. Um, but today I'll be guiding you through our English endorsement form. Um, but if you are a current endorser, I would again um, encourage you to, uh, to fill out the communications campaign form, uh, um, which should take less than five minutes. Um, so let me now bring up our English endorsement form, uh, which you should see popping up on your screen. Um, we have tried to keep it as simple and straightforward as possible. Uh, it should take you approximately 10 to 15 minutes to fill in. So again, if you are a new endorser, I would very much encourage you to take a look after this call. Um, it will include uh, information on your first name, your last name, your contact email, and the name of your entity or coalition um, who is endorsing, um, as well as a link to your website um, or online platform. Um, we ask that you indicate your position within the organization, whether that's executive director, chief executive officer, or so on, and the type and entity of coalition that you represent. Um, so in the drop down, you'll see various examples that you can choose from. However, we do have an option for other if you don't see your organization represented. Um, we then ask the main food systems topic that your entity works on, 
again, you'll see a drop down. Um, I know many of you may have overlap within these various fields. However, we do ask you to choose the main field of operation within this list. Um, and then the geographic regions that your entity is most active in. Um, you'll see various regions represented. However, if you do have a global approach, you can select global. Um, we would like to know which uh, country your entity is headquartered in, um, as well as the countries where your entity has a presence on the ground. Um, and then we ask whether you have authority to endorse the call to action um, and to confirm that your entity um, or coalition does endorse the non-state act call to action itself. Um, you um, are then asked um, if you are submitting a statement of action alongside your endorsement. Um, you do not have to submit this at the same time as you fill out the form. You can have six months to submit the statement of action. However, if you are doing so, you can enter it in this box. We have a maximum of 2,000 characters. Um, and within this endorsement, we do ask for a commitment to report against the non-state actor call to action. Um, so this is to report at least annually as appropriate um, and delivery on non-state actor against people, nature and climate. Um, any links or URLs that were included in your statement of action, you can share in this box. Um, and we ask that you also include your logo if available um, to upload directly within the form. Um, as you upload and include your logo and statement of action, um, you will also be uh, included in our wider communications efforts, including the campaign I just mentioned. In ticking this box, you'll be able to enter more information about your organization. This isn't required, but if you would like to be part of the communications campaign, we can also promote any social media platforms, any additional photos around your work um, or areas of work. And you can also include additional information, including links or organization hashtags that we can include within our campaign. Any additional comments, we do very much welcome. You can include them in this box here. And if you'd like to receive further updates from the high level champions, um, please do tick this box. Finally, we ask you to consent to submitting the form on behalf of the entity and organization. And after doing so, you can hit submit and be included within the campaign and um, become an endorser of the non-state actor call to action. Um, I understand that was a very whistle-stop tour of the endorsement form itself, but if you do have any questions, please do type them in chat and we can also come to them during our open dialogue. Um, so now I'd also like to quickly share a highlight or highlight a handful of communications opportunities that we are currently developing as part of our best efforts to support your engagement within the upcoming Rio conventions. Um, so doing various conversations with yourselves, your entities, um, and with our partners, we've identified a selection of options, which we hope may be valuable for yourselves and your organizations within our wider communications efforts. So these include a media training session, which would be facilitated by a communications expert to help you craft and refine your messages and advocacy priorities ahead of the Rio conventions. A media briefing session with a communications organization who can provide an overview and provide insights into the Rio conventions and key announcements pre-convention sessions with civil society leaders to provide a space for discussions and alignment on advocacy priorities ahead of the various conventions, um, and pre-convention sessions with negotiation experts to provide guidance and insight into the negotiation processes and how you can best navigate and engage across the conventions. Um, and then also amplific amplification of announcements and publications via social media so this would be in addition to our ongoing communications campaign to highlight your key messages and resources throughout the year. Um, so we're going to share a poll now so that you can indicate whether you are interested in us providing any of these opportunities. Um, again, we'll be identifying the options um, that you indicate as your preferences and working on that to provide the best support we can. Um, and you'll also see a box where you can share further ideas and preferences from yourselves and your organizations. We would also be very grateful to hear if there are any further interests on your side that we can provide. Um, and then lastly, while many of you may be familiar with the UNF C COP, COP29 this year, and CBD COP, COP16, um, as Gonzalo mentioned, UNCCD COP16 is gearing up to be a major global event this year and we'll be launching um, a new action agenda under the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia's COP16 presidency. Um, if you would like to learn more and potentially, potentially participate with us at COP16, 
We also encourage you to flag your interest in chat or you can email us for further information as we continue to proceed um, with our discussions. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Um, all of your answers are extremely helpful and sincerely appreciated on our side. We do hope that these communications opportunities will provide the support that are most helpful and of interest to you for the remainder of this year. And with that in mind, I will pass over to my colleague Alejo, who can lead us into the, today's uh, next points of discussion. Thank you so much, Holly. And it's great to see so many friendly faces and new faces. It's been a while since we have connected last conversations this year. And the idea for this session was to have this opportunity directly to connect between each other, I think in, in our conversations for COP27, COP28, and the many other efforts that we have worked on together. We have always highlighted this opportunity of bringing the community together, shared positions. I see names and I see different continents, regions, types of agriculture, key areas of focus, different families that we have already uh, engaged with from, from the different regions and communities that are represented in this diverse frontline food system actors network that we have here. And the idea is for to highlight this time for collaboration to share key priorities. So we want to use the rest of the time to engage and to discuss more of these opportunities uh, in which we can share opportunities for collaboration, hear from, from you, your key priorities, what are the things that we could do from the Just World Transition, from the Climate Champions team and from Ambition Loop to support your participation as we come onto the Rio conventions. This idea of diversity also brings in the points of learning and maybe in some cases also different perspectives on, on key topics that we want to mobilize looking at the food system. Those all are valid because we want to understand really where the landscape is at and where we can collaborate and bring in these different perspectives. Within the community of frontline food system actors, we have farmers, indigenous peoples, local leaders, women, youth, such a diverse group that usually has key priorities that differ from each other. The challenges that we see at the front lines of food system action require this collaborative to have this space and to have the opportunity to start this dialogue with two open interventions from Belen Citoler, the director of the World Rural Forum, and from Richard Kachungu, the CEO of the Young Emerging Farmers Initiative of Zambia, to, to frame a bit of this discussion, the ways that we have collaborated and the diversity of perspectives that we see right now. So we'll invite Belen to share a bit more about the World Rural Forum, the plans for the next months, uh, and start this conversation with all of us. Thank you, Alejo, and thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. I like a lot the name you you have put to this uh, session, that it is an open dialogue. So I hope that it brings a lot of uh, comments and insights no, during during the session. Well, I have the honor to, to start. And uh, for those that uh, don't know the World Rural Forum very well, we are a global network, mainly composed by family farmers organizations from the five continents, uh, 50 million uh, family farmers engaged in the World Rural Forum network. Some of them, I saw that they are some of our members today, UNAGRI, PROPAC, uh, ISAF2, so we are happy to be all together here. Our main uh, goal is to promote uh, family farming and rural development and the improvement of the policy frameworks in support of family farmers. And we've been working for the last 25 years, but we are quite uh, new, let's say, in the climate change uh, or the three Rio conventions agenda. Uh, but we received the mandate from our members in 2022 to give a priority and to, to, to be part of our strategic actions um, to promote the meaningful participation of family farmers in the climate change and biodiversity agendas as a mandate. So we started our work as a, at the global level because some of our members have been already more engaged, but as a global network, we hadn't uh, worked on that. So we, we took this mandate and we started uh, our work. And we started by the Climate uh, Change Convention <laughs> first, step by step. 
And last year, we had a very good representation, a strong delegation of, for the first time, no, that we were together, uh, family farmers representatives from the five continents with the support of the of the Meridian Institute and the Just Rural Transition Initiative. It was really key to, to have this strong uh, delegation at COP28. Um, and uh, with this year, we for us is very important the connection between the three Rio conventions, uh, because farmers at the farming level they are not thinking if this action is for one convention or the other, but there's a no an interconnection and there should be an integrated approach. So it is really good that you you focus uh, you put that focus too, and it's very important your your support for us in, in that, no? So we started by the Climate Change Convention. Now we are moving to the Biodiversity Convention. We will have a delegation uh, this year too. And we are starting to have a stronger no? uh, uh, knowledge and proposals in, in this sense. And we are planning to explore and start our work in the Desertification Convention too uh, this year. And uh, our main advocacy asks in these three Rio conventions are, of course, the recognition of family farmers as a strategic partner in food systems transformation and the achievement of the goals of the three Rio conventions, uh, not as a beneficiary, but a, a strategic partner in that, no? Uh, second, uh, for that, we need to strengthen our participation in the uh, what we have to to give no to this uh, dialogue, to these conversations, to these discussions, uh, to the definition of priorities. So to have a meaningful participation in all the in all these debates and and discussions, and uh, in an articulated way, no, from the global to the regional to the national, and of course we need enabling policy environments, no, to uh, scale up the key role of, of family farmers and uh, strengthen the access to climate financing that was also mentioned by uh, Gonzalo before, because only 0.3% of the uh, international um, funds for uh, the official international funds for uh, climate finance goes to family farmers. So we need to, to to have other figures, no? It's it's too 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 small in comparison to the to the contribution of family farmers. So we are working in strengthening our capacities, the capacities of family farmers organizations to be part of these very important agendas, to uh, building common messages and a common roadmap, a strategic roadmap to 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 be part of these processes. Um, in the three conventions, we focus not only in participating in the in in or attending the COP, no, but to give a continuity during the whole year to our work and how we can influence at the presidency level agenda, the different initiatives and the official negotiations. We are um, uh, well. Having uh, that is very important. No, how family farming can approach negotiations too, and and can influence and be part of these discussions. And uh, so, for that, we are strengthening our alliances and collaborations with uh, the Meridian Institute and the Just Rural Transition Initiative. That has been, as I said, fundamental. And uh, with IUCN and, and, and other partners that we were not so familiar, no, and and it's very very important in that sense. It's really good to count on the climate champions team and knowing that you have also uh, developed this ambition loop new uh, organization, no, to to strengthen our voices. So in that sense, um, thinking about the future, um, I would say that uh, it's very important to continue this collaboration, um, not only, well, first, attending the COPs is, is important, having uh, a greater presence in events or a, a communication, no, um, a greater communication impact that 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 is good no but uh, also um i think it's very important to 
as is a part of the Meridian Institute core, no? to bring different stakeholders. So to convene this, this dialogue between governments, um, international organizations, other non-state actors, no? to, to bring all the voices together, that would be really, really good. So I will stop here and well, we can continue discussing later. Thank you. Back to you, Alejo. Thank you very much, Belen. And completely agree on that, on that on every point that you mentioned in general on the advocacy priorities and very clear positioning as well from the World Rural Forum and the membership, which expands throughout the world. But that point on collaboration resonates with the mission of, of the Just World Transition and Meridian to bring. We need all the state actors together. And that's also one of the positions from the call to action that Gonzalo introduced earlier today, this idea of joint collaboration. So to continue these uh, opening interventions, I want to invite Richard Kachungu as well to, to share some perspectives. I see Richard now. Um, Richard, over to you for your opening intervention. Thank you, Alejo. I think for now I'll speak with my camera off. My network is quite bad, so I think you can bear with me. I'm not sure if I'm audible enough. Yes, we can hear you, and thank you so much for participating in the, in the complications power. Uh, and I was able to confirm if I'm audible enough. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, for, unfortunately, we have this. Uh, Richard wrote to me this morning saying that there was a difficulty with power, you now where he's based now in Zambia. So we will continue with the dialogue and invite Richard when when power is back to to participate. The idea is that now we're uh, in the part of the dialogue of this session, so we can bring in our perspectives, all of us together. Um. And when Richard comes back and join as well in the intervention. So to the extent that you're able, it would be great to see your faces, but also understanding the limitations. But it's great to see a lot of you. And want to move into this dialogue and to focus on the priorities, right? What are the key priorities that you're looking for? Uh, Holly's sharing now in the slide some ideas of guiding questions. But it would be great if you could introduce yourself to someone maybe that you don't know, uh, you have introduced some of you in the chat, and thank you for that. Share a bit more about your organization. What are you hoping, right, from the from the upcoming Rio conventions, from CBD, Biodiversity COP now in, in Cali, Colombia, from COP29 in Azerbaijan, and then from UNCCD on the certification in Saudi Arabia. How can we support you to elevate these key priorities? And if these dialogues are valuable, like what is the value of these opportunities to, to share and to connect with each other? Uh, what can we do to expand these opportunities? And then uh, positive examples of other organizations and initiatives that we can build on, build collaboration to help you bring in your points. So this is an opportunity for everyone. So feel free to raise your hand or unmute yourself and so we can start the, the conversation. And I see you, Richard, back. So whenever you feel like you're able, please unmute and can also participate in the dialogue. There you go. So sorry, I dropped off uh, connectivity. It was bad here. No problem, Richard. It's great to have you back. Okay. So I'm not sure where we are. Am I still able to speak? Or... Yes, 100%. It would be great to hear from you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Aleo. And my name is Richard from the Young Imaging Farmers Initiative. Uh, we are a youth organization that is working with young indigenous uh, communities in Zambia. We have a network of over 500,000 young people in the food system promoting sustainable production. 
And as a young leader from the Young Emerging Farmers Initiative, um, uh, we I'm actually honored to speak at this dialogue. And our priorities, especially that as we are approaching to one of the year convention, the COP29, it's very clear. Uh, frontline actors, uh, that's youth, women, and indigenous communities must place, might be placed actually at the heart of this climate financing and decision making process. We uh, we need to understand the third. Uh, that the third agricultural transformation can actually happen quickly and be more inclusive if young people are at the, actually at the heart of this transition because we are really uh, we really need those numbers to get the right people to make the the changes that we we want to I think will start happening in the food system. Uh, we face a, a, an urgent need for action in transforming our food system. In Zambia, for example, through uh, Young Emerging Farmers Initiative, we have seen the first hand uh, how sustainable agriculture and agroecology can increase food security and resilience uh, while restoring agriculture in nature. But we, can, we cannot scale these solutions alone. Uh, my advocacy is simple. Uh, climate finance must be more accessible to youth-led and indigenous youth uh, organizations like ours, specifically I call for targeted financing mechanism and prioritizing frontliner food actors in the food system. Those already e experiencing the blunt of climate impact. Our advocates at COP29 COP will emphasize on these core areas. I think uh, three areas that I want to emphasize on one, access to finance, increased access to climate finance for youth in the food system can support agroecological practices and in restore ecosystems and build climate resilience. This will only be possible if labor, energy, and land are made accessible or liberated through climate reparations. We really have to recognize that transition that we need, we so desire, is not cheap, and we need more than just passion for nature. We will emphasize uh, relevant players to take bold decisions to invest in in financial resource where uh, they are really needed. Secondly, support for just transition, ensuring that policies and funding empowers young farmers and indigenous communities without creating new inequalities. We will also emphasize the need for cons to consider historical disparities uh, towards young people and indigenous communities in the food system. So all grievances that have been uh, experienced, looking at those before actually making these decisions so that we don't make the same mistakes. Thirdly, greater representation of you, young voices in decision-making for policies, including national climate adaptation plans and biodiversity frameworks. We will demand that young people are made first priority stakeholders in decision-making process and not mere Cross-casting issues as they are usually placed, usually in statements, when we're making statements, young people are placed at the end, you, women and youth. So we want to emphasize their importance given their number and majority, especially where policy advocacy is concerned. And a multi-stakeholder engagement that is all inclusive could be a place to start, start with using these platforms to have a meaningful discussions, use meaningful discussions. The Just Rural Transition has done a tremendous job actually with working with Yethi by providing a meaningful platform for the organization's participation to be able to amplify their work, our work with young people in the food system of Zambia and the region. For instance, uh, it was able to support the participation of Yethi at the last year African Food System Forum, as well as at the COP28. This allowed Yethi to be able to tell the stories of its work and frontliners, including the conditions the indigenous young people are working under in these various uh, ventures that oh, they are actually facing the, in, in the food system. To all stakeholders, I say, we need assistance in creating scalable models that combine youth entrepreneurship and nature positive solutions. So we're talking about new business models that are responsive to the need of young people in the food system and are nature sensitive. We also seek partnership to develop uh, digital tools that can expand our reach and amplify the voices of rural youth. Overall, we need relevant stakeholders to support frontliners to meaningfully engage in these global discussions. Thank you. Back to you, Aleo. Thanks very much, Richard, and greatly appreciate the efforts to, to come back and share Jeffy's priorities. It's always 
excellent to hear from you and, and the work that you're leading. And the advocacy priorities are clear from your side. It's centering youth to mobilize action and resources into the transition and empowering, right? Like in the sense of empowerment as, as a general sense for women and youth as well to, to lead us on the process and offer the financial mechanisms to make that happen. So greatly appreciate the work and the partnership till now. Great. Now is the time to open the floor for everyone. You had also some time to read the, the questions on the side. And I invite you to introduce yourself, your organization, have your priorities as well. Um, and what you're working on right now, we'll be happy to hear. Yes, Tamisha. Thank you very much, Lego. Um, good morning, everyone. I, um, my name is Tamisha Lee, and I am president of the Jamaica Network of Rural Women Producers. Um, we are a non-government organization based in Jamaica, um, with membership of over seven um, nine hundred rural women, focusing on. Um, SDG one, SDG two, SDG five, SDG thirteen, and SDG seventeen. Um, I'm this um uh, for Jamaica different grant produce um all the voice of rural women. Often disproportionately affected by climate change. Climate justice necessitates acknowledging and refining disproportionate climate change has the communities, particularly women, who face aspirated challenges in agriculture, water security, and food security. We would like advocating fair representation. We call for equitable representation in climate policy discussions, empowerment of rural women through inclusive decision-making processes is pivotal for a just climate um, and initiatives. Um, we want to look also at disaster risk reduction in rural community induced Fortunately, I think Tamisha's Connectivity was weak at that point, but I think we got it from the points of clear, fair representation, having a space to to mobilize action as well. Her work on disaster risk reduction, and now Jamaica has also been facing uh, hurricanes during this season, and the Jamaica Network of Rural Women Producers has been at the front lines of that support. I see, Matthews, an invitation to you to continue this dialogue. Hi Alejo, hi everyone. Uh, great to see very familiar faces. Great to meet new uh, faces in the space because there's never enough. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, just like Gonzalo, I am a farmer from Poland. Uh, and first things first, I, I'm part of the family business, which is producing highest quality hay and supplying that to Polish and international markets. On top of that, uh, I have a privilege of running two businesses, European Carbon Farmers and the Farm of Francesco, both of which are about transforming food systems. Uh, and then I have a few board roles, like to the EU Solid Mission um, of the European Commission, which I encourage you to check out and benefit from if you haven't yet. Um, a lot of things that come to mind when it comes to the guiding questions and when it comes to this discussion, but I will keep myself constrained and just uh, make three points. Uh, point number one, and this is really the key point, is thank you very, very much to the high level champions, to Meridian, to Ambition Group, uh, Just Rural Transition, and all of those who are in this call and many, many others for what you and we are doing. It's tremendous, it's crazy to look where food systems and, and farming conversation is in free Rio conventions in comparison with 2021, when I started on Gonzalo team as uh, youth, uh, regenerative agriculture youth fellow on high level champions team. Uh, and it's just spectacular. And there's a very long way to go, which is my point number three. But but uh, 
the path that we have trodden uh, together is just crazy. And I know right now is extremely busy time with New York Climate Week happening, with the free conventions, with other events. So all, all of us are working very, very hard. Um, but I think it's, it's a good challenge to, to be in. So, so thank you and congratulations. That's point number one, and that's the key point. Point number two is uh, let's continue the work that we are doing. Me personally, I barely had the bandwidth to do something meaningful at the COP29 or in the UNFCCC process. I very much know that other two Rio conventions are critical and building bridges between one and another Rio conventions is, is even more important than just working in each of those. But my bandwidth, even though I do have team and I have amazing people that I'm working with many of you in this call, uh, that is like 0.1%, if not less, of what needs to be done. So, so thank you to those who have much bigger resources for doing the work. And I know those resources are still not enough to what needs to be done, but but that's amazing. From, from my perspective, and that's kind of moving me to point number three, uh, my personal priority is for personal and, and those institutions that I represent, UNFCCC, who will be at the COP physically in week two, very likely, still looking for two badges so you can help, <laughs> let us know, uh, organizing some kind of workshop uh, with uh, young researchers in Poland before that to kind of uh, bring new people to the to the to the process and make them aware. Uh, so more information coming about that through my social media channels. Uh, in like recently as well, and and please support and benefit uh, or recommend other people to to join that. And then second process after UNFCCC that that we are particularly following is uh, CFS Committee for Food Security. Um, so just mentioning that process out there. I know many of you are involved, some are maybe hearing that for the first time, it's an important process that in my personal or in our personal assessment of policy processes, uh, we prioritize this one and building bridges between UNFCCC and CFS uh, as, as more critical for us than two other Rio conventions, even though two other Rio conventions are critical anyway, but are just a little bit lower on our priorities. Uh, and then final point within the point, point number three is, uh, you, you know that I'm working on that and and that didn't change. And that is still kind of the missing, missing magic, if you will, that we are seeing. It's amazing the progress at the international level. And there are, of course, still gaps to close and so on. But, but that's amazing. The, the, the name of the game is translating that at the national level between climate ministry in the case of the Republic of Poland and Minister of Agriculture and Rural Affairs. And once again, a lot of success is there, but we have 95% of the job, if not more, still to do. So, so what we are very actively working on is building those bridges, making people meet, uh, design policies, or even think about designing policies that talk with each other and are systemic in nature and not dealing with climate or agriculture only. Um, and very happy to use the international process and also high level champions work with the case studies that are coming up and all these wonderful marketing things that you guys are doing and you will be doing to, to support the global process and very much so leverage the global process for progress on the ground in our case in Poland and the European Union because this is where we're from. Um, but, but, but other parts of the world are equally important. And of course, very happy to, to share our le learnings, insights, connections, um, and uh, looking forward to continue being engaged with this process because without you guys and your work, especially at High Level Champions, none of our work would be possible or very, very little of our work would be possible. So once again, point number one, very grateful and congratulations. Sorry for talking too much. Those Not at all, Matthew. Thank you. From, from thank you so thank much. You for this space. It was a great overview and agreed. We have achieved a lot in terms of bringing the presence. Now we have to elevate it and continue making progress on, on uh, yes, this translation into action, moving this international to a national, making sure that the priorities are given into reality. Uh, I see Gunsham in the line. Right. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Gunsham Tiboran from Mauritius. 
and I am the president of Falcon Association, in formerly Agricultural Life Cooperative Organic Network. And also, I am a board member of WFO and SACAO. Uh, and uh, for me, from my views, I, I came from an island. And uh, I think uh, we must push also islands in the front line because all the decision in COP is taking, it's uh, not really too much focus in island wise. It's most because uh, at the con continent level. And it is difficult because we are different with, uh, with uh, the continent. So we are suffering with uh, cyclone, there is a wind, there is a rise of sea level, and uh, also there is uh, the heavy rainfall, there is a flood often, and uh, especially we have a lot of soil erosion. When we talk about soil erosion, we have also the uh, sea rays also. So on both sides, we are suffering on both sides. And uh, it, it's because of the climate change, there is uh, the temperature raise and the uh, ice melt, all this is raising. And also we have seen not only because we are a small island, but we form in a small uh, land, but we have sea product, pro, uh, sea farming. So, so we produce a lot of uh, seafood. And this uh, seafood is being, uh, we have seen the special, there is a lot of uh, diminution in fish because of the, from the north part of the, of the sea, of the Atlantic uh, Ocean, the uh, fish came and they eat all this uh, fish in the Indian Ocean. So there is a, an exchange of, uh, of uh, living animal, uh, animals in the, the sea, so they are variation. So they are moving from each, each ocean to other ocean. So all, and also we have seen that the cyclone is more often. So all these things is happening and uh, we need we farmers in, in a small island. We suffer, and uh, we are the one we are export importing a lot of food, also. So there is also this uh, thing that uh, exportation is increasing, and uh, that we are in a period of transition. And I think uh, for this period of transition, when we are talking, there is a uh, lot of land abundance because there is no use entering in this sector. So from my perspective, we are at Falcon, we are working a lot for the youth to enter as farmers. And when we we have seen that also we need to innovate the innovation. So that uh, because we we do uh, vertical, we are talking about control environment uh, structure that we can form because of climate change where we can control all this climate. So this is uh, important. And also that uh, youth is willing to be in the, with technology and more production. So less input and more production. But this has to be done in training. We have to start with the kids from now to start encouraging them to do farming and then we can have the food procession in future. But uh, we have a challenge here because there is also the, we have seen that the service sector is paying more than the farming sector. So it's, uh, it, there is a, a less income. So you are going more, less effort and they are getting more money. For example, IT, they are in the, uh, control uh, the AC room and they are getting more money. They will not be uh, interested in uh, agriculture because there is a lot of investment also and the result is very far. It's not going to get the result in the one week, two weeks. They will have to wait uh, three weeks, uh, 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 three months. So after three months, maybe there is, during this period, there is uh, some time 
the weather. We don't know the weather. What is the condition? And all the input we have, we may lose. So there's a high risk here uh, of uh, to be sure that the the input that we have put, the income, the money we have put, that we will receive it. So we have to come with some solution, some insurance to protect this uh, kind of crops. And uh, for all these things, I think it's uh, it's also important to have the training because uh, this, uh, what we are talking, uh, maybe the youth do not see it, but by training, we can show them what is the future, how they can ensure their farming, they can get their life and they can produce food for our own to survive because also we have seen that we have to go through the processing because we have a sometimes we get a lot of crops food uh, we produce but uh, we are not able to storage and it become uh, waste so it goes in the lost and waste food so we have to protect them uh, and it it can be done through processing here also there's a trans transition and also there we need to do the like to have uh, more training and we have seen that uh, many family farming that there was before now it's diminishing because uh, there is no connection between the elder and the youth for example, a family that is forming, they they have to to teach them uh, how to can process or market. They can enter in the business. So this training and empowerment of this youth to be engaged with their family, that they can uh, become a a to sustain the food system alone. So this is uh, my views. Thank you. Thanks to you very much, Gunshan, for the very comprehensive review of, of the difficulties as well and the, and the front lines, especially for island context. But I think some of the trends that you have identified connect to uh, Richard mentioned before in terms of youth and empowerment of youth, also bring in the social context, right? That agriculture, farming is also a dynamic that grows with the economy, with social changes, right? And and in generations as well, how to build that knowledge and keep family farming alive um, as the sector keeps transitioning, right? And and we see the impacts of front line, uh, of climate change at the front lines. Thank you, Gunsham. And we'll pass it on to Bonnie. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Yeah, it's been really interesting listening in and relating uh, similar challenges here in Western Australia. So for context, uh, I work for Regen WA, a network for farmers and stakeholders interested in uh, regenerative agriculture. And so, yeah, Western Australia, well, we mainly have members in the southwest and so we have really ancient soils, um, but the southwest of Western Australia is also a biodiversity hotspot. So we have a lot of endemic species um, but also very vulnerable because of a lot of land clearing for agricultural production. So because of this and a lot of other challenges facing, you know, the climate, biodiversity, and then food production, um, Perth NRM, which is the overarching organisation that I work for, initiated Regen WA to support the farmers that were actually producing food but considering protecting and restoring their on-farm natural assets. So it was about supporting them, learning from each other and sharing. So really trying to, you know, create that from the ground up support where it's the farmers were being empowered to learn from each other. Um, and especially a lot of what others have mentioned about the next generations and supporting young people. It's about, you know, taking farming into the next generation, so making sure that we have, you know, a viable 
ag system here uh, in the future. So Regen WA's um, members are not only farmers, it's grown to actually involve a lot of consumers. So that's where it ties in the whole food systems side of things, um, trying to raise awareness of the challenges facing farming, um, but then also how that farm, well, farmers and consumers and everyone can actually be a part of the solution. Um, so we do a lot of awareness raising uh, for consumers, um, but also that on-ground farmer learning. And another project that's evolved that we're working on, uh, we've just wrapped up, is a natural capital accounting project. So that was actually going out, developing baseline condition reports for on-farm natural capital so that farmers can actually use that as a, a tool to be able to inform their management decisions actually consider their natural assets in their whole farm production. And then, you know, with those two projects, so supporting the farmers, creating the evidence for that change or that baseline so they can see how they're affecting or that what management decisions are influencing their natural assets. Uh, there's also that collaboration and people side of things and the social impact. So, where uh, we've also got a collective impact project, which is all about bringing together um, people from all the different areas involved in food production. Uh, so, and that includes First Nations organisations um, from government and through, and it's trying to involve everyone, so farmers. And we've had meetings where we're all trying to work through getting a overarching purpose. And so we have shared visions and goals that everyone can agree on. So that way when, you know, investors do look at supporting this change in this space, we can demonstrate that we're all working together so it has that scalable impact. So that's something quite positive that's come out of these projects and hoping that, you know, linking up with organisations around the world, we can all link up for that global collective impact scale. Um, and another thing as well is that we really try and support or like having farmers and people come to the table. So our chair of Region WA is actually Stuart McAlpine, who's on this call, and he's a farmer. So it's really good to be able to have that on-ground influence at that level. Thanks very much, Bonnie. It's great to see you and see Stuart in the call. And thank you for the overview of the work and also the regenerative influence and the power of regenerative transition. And so the different ways that can provide support to farmers and nature capital. And definitely this topic keeps coming back in the conversation of collaboration, bringing different stakeholders together, the work that you're doing with First Nations, but also working with different key stakeholders that are at the front line of this food system transformation. I see Tamisha's hand. I also would like to invite you, considering that for the time that we have, we also want to check back. We mentioned in the beginning, we want to test these priorities. And um, these are outlined in the call to action. Uh, this is the language that currently is there in the call to action as the four, the, the principles, the five principles to, to lead, right? And what are the key asks that we have identified? Uh, via engagements directly with farmers, indigenous peoples, women, youth, and local leaders. And what are those key actions that we need to elevate, right, in order to transition to, to solutions? So the invitation is also, if you can read them, they're on the left in, in English and the right in French. I'm trying to see if this resonates with you, if this resonates with the key asks that we are trying to elevate, if there is something else that needs to be included, something that should be rethought. Any feedback on the language here would be greatly appreciated as well. While you read, I invite Tamisha as well to, to share her perspectives. Okay, thank you, Aliza. I'm very sorry for that. Um, my internet um, has been unstable. Um, I was touching on the building resilience. Um, we would have just um, passed through a Category 4 um, hurricane burial, and um, I cannot begin to speak of the the damage um, that it has left us here in Jamaica, um, our membership. 
Um, so rural communities are very vulnerable to climate-induced disasters. So we ought to prioritize disaster risk reduction strategies in this area. Um, our focus is on empowering um, our women with education, training, and resources to mitigate risk and enhance preparedness. Um, we need for a just transition a community-centric approach um, to add locally driven disaster management strategies that harness traditional knowledge and community-based approaches, ensuring sustainable resilience and adaptation. Um, for a just transition, we need sustainable agricultural practices. Rural women are the forefront of agriculture, promoting climate resilient farming techniques such as agroforestry and crop diversification is essential for adaptation and mitigation efforts. Um, renewable energy accessibility, access to clean energy is pivotal. We push for initiatives ensuring rural communities, especially women, have access to renewable energy sources, promoting both sustainability and economic empowerment. We need, of course, greater access to financing. We need the barriers to be reduced. Um, financial inclusivity. Rural women encounter barriers in accessing climate finance, facilitating access to funding mechanism, microfinance and capacity building initiatives um, is also imperative. We need to support um, entrepreneurship, tailored financial assistance and training program that encourages entrepreneurship among rural women in climate resilient um, sectors. Uh, we need inclusive um, decision making. We stress the importance of inclusive participatory approaches to policy formation, formulation, co-creation of climate initiatives involving rural women, ensure diverse perspectives, fostering innovation, innovative solutions. We need knowledge sharing and capacity building. Collaboration and knowledge sharing platforms are vital for co-creation building the capacity of rural women through education and technology exchange enhances their contribution to climate action. Um, in closing, Jamaica Network of Rural Women stand ready to collaborate, share expertise, and contribute to transformative actions that center on gender responsive, equitable, and inclusive climate solutions for rural communities. I will hand back over to you, um, Aligo. And thanks for your time. Thanks very much, Tamisha. And thank you for coming back to the conversation. Your perspective is always valued in particular on this gender response perspective to climate change and highlighting the role of women and the support that you do also in disaster risk reduction, um, as you have been leading a lot of efforts in the past months to to support rural communities on the front lines of, of the of the climate disasters ongoing. Thank you for your feedback and reflections. And thank you everyone for sharing your key priorities and discussion points, your advocacy points, and so diverse to the as to represent the regions and the backgrounds that you represent, but also the communities and the priorities that we see there. So I invite you also when you introduce yourself, your organization, if you want to share your thoughts on the um, uh, on the slide that you see there, on the language that you recognize, if there are any changes or suggestions, much appreciated. I see Alcali, Tamar, and Stuart in that order. Alcali, over to you. Hello, good, good afternoon. Uh, from the Gambia, I am very sorry that the internet connection is not very strong in my country. I will be coming in and out sometimes. You excuse me for that. <laughs> it is a, a poor network. Uh, my name is Alkali MFCC. I am the head of program for the National Alliance for Agroecology of the Gambia. The, the Alliance is, 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 is formed to promote agroecology and its best practices in the Gambia. 
And regarding the point, the priorities for discussion, these are priorities that are very important because uh, what we do, among what we do, is to support women and young people in the Gambia in their practice to agroecology. We know it is not easy because uh, it is, it is, it is because uh, encouraging women to go into agroecology is like some of them will be will receive different information, different advocacy from government officials from these multinationals that yes, you are wasting your time in producing a small plot of land. You know, you have just what you can eat and what you feed your family. Why don't you go in for this mechanized agriculture where you use this pesticide, you use this chemical fertilizers and so on. So among what we do, we sensitize them, we bring them together, we support them at the same time. We also bring them into the clusters. So regarding the priority areas for this question here, it is very important that we increase the involvement of people, rural people in the fight for the climate disaster. And what we what we what 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 is more important is the inclusion aspect of it. There cannot be any support, there cannot be any solution if rural farmers are not included in decision making. Be it local, be it national and international, it has to be something that they themselves are involved. You cannot decide for a farmer in his absence. What are you deciding for them? What do you really need if you want to decide for someone who is not there? Will you know? You don't know what the person needs. You don't know what solution the person is putting in place before even you call the person. So the inclusiveness is very, very important. And this cannot go behind the farmers that have been involved in the solution to this problem. And that inclusive is looking at their indigenous practices to solve problems. It's very important. We don't just take, you understand, the, the, the conventional, yeah, you take the, the, the technology aspect of what you said. Yes, this is the best way to solve problems. Whereas these farmers, rural farmers, have their very own local solutions. And these solutions, when you consider them, they are one of the best solutions. Or if they are not the best, at least they will be one of the best solutions that you can use to solve the problem. So our own point here is the inclusiveness of rural farmers, of farmers themselves in decision making, be it local, national, as international, is very important. And we at my organization level, we are playing that role. We make sure that in any meetings, in any global, in any meeting in the country, that where we are invited, we just don't do as, as people that are working, promoting agroecology, but we also write to them. The moment you invite us, we will invite our farmers. There are mostly local language interpretation in such meetings so that the farmers will know exactly what the policy is. So that the farmers will know exactly what you are thinking about. Because not all of them can read and write. The, the moment you translate into local language in that meeting, they will know exactly the direction that you are taking them. And when they contribute, their contribution will also be translated to the authorities that are present so they can know exactly what the farmers want. So at my organization, we are not behind. We are promoting inclusiveness, make sure that farmers know what is exactly their problem and the solution they take part in deciding the solution for their problem. The other point that I want to make is respect and value the traditional knowledge. You see, like under the environmental degradation, I would love to share that story. Uh, that we, I would love to share that, that that project with the team. Under the environmental degradation, women and farmers and some farmers in rural Gambia come up with a unique solution, a unique way to at least reclaim back their lands, which you understand authorities never thought of. So these are things that I believe that when you respect and value the traditional knowledge of these farmers, you will learn a lot from them and you will be able to utilize their knowledge to come into a solution whereby problems are not going to be exaggerated like they are. So these are points that because we have a project whereby women are coming up with unique ways of reclaiming the lands that they are no more cultivated because of environmental degradation, because of soil erosion, which growing erosion. But they have their ways to use to make sure that they are reclaiming that land. And government officials, international NGOs, never know exactly what is happening. And they have reclaimed vast areas. When we went there, we realized that 
you know, there are other areas whereby government officials are coming up with projects, coming up with high and that's coming up with 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 with, uh, with, with guardian buses, but they could not reclaim the land the way these indigenous, these rural farmers are reclaiming that land. So to make my point short, I think uh, I really appreciate this meeting and I really appreciate the priorities that we, we, we put in place. But but I just have a suggestion that it is it is important and that is very important in preparing in pre session in pre cop session the farmers are invited let them sit and know because so many farmers when you tell them about cop cop they don't know you understand when i went for the cop uh in dubai when i come back i was given i was i uh, we organized a meeting session and then talking to farmers about what has been happening many of them don't know so it's important that in pre cop sessions in at our national levels, so farmers let them be present, let them know exactly this and this and this is how things are going. These are the preparations that countries are making, so that they will put in their suggestions, not only the, the national aspect whereby the government officials will only decide for these farmers and they carry everything and go to COP. This is why their voices could not be heard because they are not present in decision making. So on that note, on behalf of my organization and then what we're doing, we really appreciate this meeting and we look forward to in, in different meetings that farmers will be, the voices of farmers will be heard because they are the key in every national development. Thank you. Thanks to you, Alkali. Much appreciated. And thank you for the comment directly on the priorities. Seeing the time, we are very short on time. So I invite you, uh, Tamana Stewart, to give your remarks uh, brief, but please share with us your key points. We will then circulate this. This is not the last opportunity you will have to share your uh, feedback on these priorities. If you want to share more, we'll uh, follow up with a meeting summary with all of the comments from this discussion, but more opportunities as well to engage bilaterally. You know that you can always reach out to the JRT to have a conversation, but also to circulate and, and keep discussing the priorities. With that, Tamar, over to you. Hi, nice to see you all again here, familiar faces. Uh, I will be very short, uh, keeping in mind the time uh, limitation. Uh, I won't talk much about the organization. I can share the link later, but maybe just to uh, give you information on participation of our, our representatives in uh, uh, Rio conventions, the only uh, uh, is the Baku COP29, where two of my colleagues uh, will eventually, we're still waiting for confirmation, but hopefully they will be participating. It won't be me this time, unfortunately, but uh, there will be uh, two others, and I will um, inform you later once this is confirmed. Um, uh, one interesting note also, uh, I want just to highlight the importance of uh, participation in this type of dialogues and groups uh, for, for us, uh, for my organization, it was the first time last year participating in COP28 and it, it gave us a huge knowledge um, and awareness generally on the issues on, on, a, on things happening on a global a wider uh, spectrum. We, I, I myself participated in uh, international symposium on agriculture biodiversity and food, food security in Canada later, and um, as a as a work, member of the working group, also made my um, comments on technical roadmap on biodiversity, which was really helpful. Why I'm saying it because uh, many many here already mentioned that participating and giving opportunity to organizations like our and to smaller farming communities to be present to, in a wider kind of platforms is really um, uh, giving us a lot of knowledge um, and helping us to harmonize the policies internally within our countries as well. So generally, like making points here out of everything we said before is like harmonizing agricultural policies, promoting good practices, and maybe giving like a point here on the slide which which is open here you you make a point on respect and value traditional knowledge but also uh, giving importance to promoting good uh, practices uh, not only to local knowledge because in our cases we often face difficulties when talking to local farmers who are 
very often reluctant to receive new modern te technologies or approaches. So this is some, something that we're struggling with. So it might be uh, worth making note of that as well. So this good uh, practices and promotion of that and making raising awareness on those is really important for for a smaller uh, local farming communities here in my country at least. Uh, and the importance of building coalitions and implementation of policies on the ground is really, really crucial. So maybe these two points uh, when it comes to, to, to this slide um, here uh, for the priorities for discussion. I won't mm -hmm. keep you longer. <laughs> so maybe I'll comment uh, when, when you share the document on the, on the rest of it. Many thanks, Tamar. Greatly appreciate it and good to have you in this conversation. Thank you to everyone who has been contributing in the chat as well. Please feel free to continue doing so. I invite Stuart to give us our last intervention for this dialogue and then bring to the close. Yeah. Thank you, Leo, and nice to see some familiar faces. Um, yeah, just I I think uh, I think the points, the, the priorities are, are really good. And I think um, the value that um, I got out of attending COP last year was to bring back um, some examples from, from some of the wonderful global people that I met. But I think that that sharing of stories and then actually meeting with other stakeholders at events like that that are integral to um, the transformation of food systems as well is is really really important um, and I think the ability to to share those stories and sometimes it's been said to me many times since I've been back that we need someone someone from the outside to come into our ecosystems or our countries to to share their stories and it seems to have sometimes greater greater impact so i think that capacity building is 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 really important um, at a local level but i also think forming those links and understanding everyone's part in the supply chain and that we need to we need to change the, the for, for true food systems transformation it's not just about what happens on the country. It's it's the role of finance and research and many aspects, logistics and um, play as well. Um, and I think um, the ability to um, you know to pass on knowledge to to each other, whether that be young younger people or generational knowledge as well, I think is is really is really a really important process. Um, and to inspire each other. Because you know, unfortunately, the degradation to our farming system continues, and the more we can um, come together uh, in our own ecosystems with the examples of a collective impact, like we're doing here, that Bonnie talked about, but um, also you know, doing it at a global level, then the more chance we've got of reaching the scale that's required to to reach the targets that we want to get to. So uh, yeah, that that's about it, and I think the only other quick thing I'd say is we're in the process in um, uh, putting together a, what we hope to be a global standard event in Western Australia called Rebuilding Our Food Systems. It'll be on the 17th of 18th of September next year. Um, yeah, Rebuilding Our Food Systems, Collective Responsibility for Soil Health, Human Wellbeing and Food, food Security um, Conference, and we want to make that a global event and uh, in the global south because we see a lot happening in the global north but we want to try and create a world standard event in the global south to bring people together as well so we'll be in touch about that as well fantastic Stuart thank you so much for the contribution and and, and this great way of, of wrapping up and um, I invite then Gonzalo Munoz and, and Melissa to close us in this dialogue but I want to remind everyone that we are at your disposal to any conversation, anything you need and want to continue these engagements, you can reach out to us you know, or different channels. Thank you. Just wanted to thank and celebrate the opportunity of listening to each of you. And thank you uh, to you, Alejo, and the organizers for setting the scene. I think that we are all agreeing that we have a very important milestone in, a, in a, the history of this community ahead of us in the next, let's say, 18 months. So I'm really pleased that we had the possibility of uh, 
of, of gathering, uh, listening to each of us, uh, taking some notes, and then, of course, be clear that we, uh, we will have to keep on working in a very strong uh, collaboration amongst all of us in order to achieve all of our goals. So thank you again. Uh, looking forward for any of you that hasn't signed the call to action, please do so. That's a very relevant element of our success. Even though, of course, the most of the success is related to what we do in the field, in the ground, in an everyday basis. At the end, we know that we are strongly working together. And that is totally related to all of us signing the same document and making it that document stronger and stronger on time. So please do so and encourage others to also endorse the call to action as, as more uh, number we have in terms of endorsers, stronger will be our message to uh, everyone at every level, including, of course, the political level that we need to influence in this ne next uh, 18 months. So thank you very much, Melissa. Thanks so Pachino. much, Gonzalo. And Gonzalo, did I hear that you're offering a bottle of wine to the person who can bring in the most people endorsing? Yes, I'm a wine that. farmer. <laughs> So yes, that's <laughs> that's is. a promise that I am, will be really happy to fulfill. <laughs> so there is a bit of competitiveness. Of that. No, we really, really do appreciate it. I think if you are reaching out to your fellow farmers and farmers organizations to tell them of the value of this, it is going to be much more powerful than us reaching out. So thank you so much for all of your support in that. Thank you for joining today. It's been absolutely um, incredible to listen to all of your uh, priorities or different where you're coming from from what's important for you, banality that's coming out of that. And really, you know, I think that as um, Belen said right at the beginning, the title of this file, we've got to put farmers, frontline food system actors at the center of all of this. Um, I think we really heard just why that's important um, and and that, that space like this. So thank you for also just confirming that this space like this and that some of the work that we do does make a difference and you do value it. Do give us feedback if there are other, uh, other formats that work for you or other ideas that you have to kind of feed into some of what you saw presented today or some of what you think we could be prioritizing in the future. We do want to make sure this is as useful for your work um, as, as, as it can be. Um, but I know we're going a little bit over time, so thank you for your patience. Thank you also to the interpreters for a great job that they're doing and the other technical uh, people who are working behind the scenes to, to make a dialogue like this happen. Um, so yes, uh, with that, without any more, I will draw the dialogue to a close. I look forward to continuing the engagement with you though in the coming weeks, months and years. Thank you, Thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone.